you'd give that secret wisdom that Elisha got that messed up with uh, the king of Syria because it's like he could hear, Elisha could hear what he was planning in his own bedroom. Father, impart that, I pray, to the Israelis that they could bring these kids and people back unharmed, unscathed. And Lord, that you would protect Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for all of those, Lord, that are hunkered down in fear even now. Lord, in the midst of all of this, that nation, God, would the fulfillment of Hebrews 11, Lord, that the nation of Israel would turn to you, their Messiah. They would know you powerfully and mightily. Even so, Lord Jesus, come in the midst of terror. Reveal your powerful self to them in every way. Yes. Yes. You can tell this is October. October is our summer. <laughs> you know, summer, we don't have a, a big exodus as much as we do in October for summer, in November. But we're glad to have Cheryl with us, yay, on her scooter. But she wouldn't let me ride her scooter this morning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
we had a great time in uh, grandmother and granddaddy's seminar yesterday. Thank Mike and Pat for putting that on. Some really great nuggets in that time together, right, Stan? Stan gave a testimony this morning about how much it blessed him and Beth. Um, what am I doing up here? Oh, scripture. So, I'm not going to read this story. If you don't know the story of David and Goliath by now, well, you're going to hear it anyway. Last week, we looked at how the Israelites um, continually forgot all of the mighty acts of God and grumbled and complained and whined to the point where when they came up to go into the promised land, God said, nope, I'm sorry. You're going to have to spend 38 more years in the, in the desert. They'd already been in two. And so many of you are going to die out of this age that still have a slave mentality. See, that was a problem. They, they didn't know who they were. They still had a slave mentality. And, you know, that's what they kept saying. Let's go back and be slaves. It was better. And I remember uh, when communism broke in Romania um, and going over there, how some of them says, oh, we want to go back to communism. Things are too hard. The reason they were too hard is because people had been controlled for so long in their life, they didn't know how to act. It was easier to be told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and all that kind of stuff than it was to start doing stuff on your own. The interesting thing is uh, uh, the believers in Jesus were the ones that, that began to thrive because they had been so long kind of rebelling against all of that in a, in a, in a way. So it's, it is interesting, but that's kind of what you had there. Now, we have this situation where this, in this picture is with King Saul and his army against the Philistines. And this is after the basically Samuel had gone to him and said that the kingdom has been stripped from you um, and given to another, which would come in time. And so Saul's out here. They had this big giant who comes named Goliath of Gath, who was, uh, it says he was six cupids in a span, which is almost ten feet according to their interpretation there. Can you imagine? Huge guy. And he, he would come out, and he was, had come out for the last 40 days uh, and saying, let someone from your side come over and fight me. If he wins, we'll serve you, and if, and if, and if, uh, you, if you lose, you'll serve us, basically. So we're going to fight it out man to man. Well, nobody. So, and you got to understand, Saul was a big man, huge. He stood a head taller than anybody. When, he, he, when, he, when they were choosing who would be king, he stood a head taller than everybody in his whole tribal world. So anyway, he was a big man. And he, he, nah, he, didn't, he wasn't going to have any part of that. But he had put out this this bounty on Goliath that anybody that would that would go out and defeat him he would give him their daughter and money and all kinds of other stuff well David young David had left Saul uh, and gone home you know he was playing the harp and singing because Saul would have this evil spirit come on him and, and he would play him and it would bring him relief and I don't think he ever really noticed David. He just noticed the psalm player was there, and it helped. Uh, big palace, and, and uh, it's kind of like Kat said in that first service. Sometimes they play for venues, and nobody even, they just hear the music. Nobody even sees them, basically. And so he had gone, and then his father says, take food to your brothers. Three of his brothers were fighting uh, with Saul's army. 
And he goes, and uh, he leaves. You know, these are things I used to think about. What do you do about a sheep? Well, he left it with an attendant. Duh, if you read the scriptures, it's all there. And then uh, uh, he goes and takes all of this stuff. I guess he must have taken several donkeys full of stuff and uh, cheese for the captains of the thousand. And uh, so he leaves those with this other attendant that I guess went with him. And he goes down among the army, and he's asking them what's going on. And this big Goliath comes out and bellows his stuff out. And, and David says, well, what's the deal? And uh, they said, well, Saul said that if anybody will go take this guy out, um, he'll bless them with lots of stuff. And David said, kept asking the men around him, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, they were, I think, all seeing him as just this giant that they didn't want to fight. David said, who is this guy that's defying the armies of the living God? Anyway, he kept talking. Eliab, his older brother, came and rebukes him and says, you're full of pride, and, and you just came out to watch the battle. And, and uh, I always wondered after that, what did... Uh, what did someone say to Eliab after David does his thing? We all know the end of the story, so I'm not giving it away. Um, but I'm sure he must have changed his tune big time. That's my little brother. Oh, my God. Anyway, David kept talking about this, and finally Saul heard about it, sent for him. And... David said to Saul, I love this, let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight with him. Let no man's heart fail. Now, isn't it interesting? Here is, here is and, and, and we've looked at this before. Bring the Deuteronomy passage up because this is something that they heard and it was read to them, and they knew only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So what is it that is going on in these, these Hebrew minds as they're facing this giant? Didn't they remember how the stories of how God had delivered them? How God had, had, where Joshua and Caleb led the Israelites in and the, the giants of that time were there and they destroyed them all? Did they not remember that? It seems like the only one that did was David. It's interesting. David if you think about it, because I, I, we, we kind of need to put ourselves in the position of all of these, whether it's David or whether it's the, the other Israelites, because it's so interesting how quickly we forget even the little things along our life that God has done for us, how quickly we forget um, how God delivered us out of situations, how we faced giants and and, and mountains in our lives, and somehow we made it through them all. And, and God delivered us ultimately, but we, we, we forget. And so these kids forgot that stuff, even the older kids. And the king, who was not really thinking in the context of that way because he had already rebelled against God, he kind of took things into his own hands. He was a tall man, big, strong, and so... I'll take things into control here, and, and that's King Saul. I don't think King Saul was thinking that their God would deliver them because he would have called for a priest with an ephod and said, tell us, because they did this all the time. They did it when they were 
going into the promised land. Tell us, should we go up or not? And the word of the Lord would come, go up, I've given them to you. Well, they'd go up with confidence because somehow God's armies fought with them. Because they always went against forces that were insurmountable, that were bigger than they. And, you know, here you have this little boy, because Saul looks at him and says, how can you fight them? You're just a kid. You're not, you're not even a warrior. This guy's been trained from his youth just to be a, a warrior. But guess how, what David was trained in? Yes, he was trained by the anointing of God to recognize God's power, not his own ability. Now, he tells Saul this. He says, when I was keeping the sheep, I had a lion that came and took one of my sheep away. And I, I, um, I went after it. And when he dropped it, he came after me, and I grabbed him by the goatee and beat him to death with my rod. And he did the same with a bear. And Saul looked at him. He says, um, Okay. Go ahead, the Lord be with you. So they tried to put they tried to put uh, all this armor on David, and of course you've got to be trained in armor to move in it to do. And David couldn't move; he just basically said, ah, "I don't need this." Grabbed his staff, went by and grabbed a few five five smooth stones out of the creek, and went out to meet the Philistine. And this Philistine starts cursing him, like, what am I, a dog that you come out here? And it said he cursed him in the name of his gods. And he says, I'm going to feed you to the birds today. And David responded to dear old Philistine and David said to him you come to me with a sword a spear and a javelin by the way this javelin this, the spearhead was probably as, almost as tall as I am but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defied. David didn't walk out there. What do you mean, man? I'm cool. I got my slingshot, my staff. I am so cool. I'm going to take this giant down. He would have been fed to the birds for sure. But he came out there in a humble kind of a way, but making a declaration about his God. That was at the forefront of David's mind and heart. His God. Where did he learn this? He learned it spending time. If you read the Psalms, David was intimately acquainted with his God. And I think sometimes in preparation for facing crisis, if that's not in your world, when the crisis come, you're going to be blown away. And guess what? You're going to, it doesn't mean God's going to, you know, he'll come and clean up the wounds and so forth. But there'll be another crisis again. We always will face those, whatever they may be. And some may seem insurmountable. God said it this service better than I did last. But they'll seem like they just cannot, that they're too much for us. Well, that's the point. They are too much. I think sometimes we, we just consider that if we just control the situation, if we're in control, and sometimes I don't think even that we realize that we're doing that. But when there's fear and frustration and when there's... When there's 
all kinds of, of different um, uh, anxiety around something particularly, you can pretty much understand that it's something you're trying to control. Somehow or other, you're trying to figure it out on your own and in your own strength and in your own power. You know, it, it's a fearful thing to trust, isn't it? To let go and let something else take care of that. I, I, I walk my dog at night sometimes, and we've, we have coyotes. I actually saw a coyote come up our street one one in the broad daylight, he he was not bold because he was just by himself. So I know we have them, and you can hear them sometimes. And and I walk my little pooch out, and he's just a little guy, but um, but he's got a nose on him. And um, I've thought about that. What if a pack of these coyotes came? Because I'm going to defend that little guy. I, I I love him too much. I'm not going to let them just eat him and run. No way. I'm sorry. Uh, they can eat me. Puccini. We just call him Pooch. <laughs> and, and I was thinking about that one night. So I would, what would I do? Pull out my little pocket knife and, and, you know. I thought, okay, I might get one or two um, with that. You know, and stab him in the right place. And, you know, thinking about that kind of ridiculous thinking that all, only men do. Um and how they would overcome in their own power. But then it hit me one night. It hit me, why don't I ask God for the anointing of Samson if that happened? You ever thought about that? Why is that anointing any different today than it was in Samson's day? Tell me. What's the difference? Same Holy Spirit. Samson was not a big guy. Samson was probably about my frame. He wasn't one of these Hercules guys because when they cut his hair off, he didn't have any strength. It was the anointing of God, it said, that would come upon him and he would do all of those kinds of crazy things that he did. When his hair grew out, the anointing came back and he pushed those, those things down and killed more people in his... But he was very humble at that time too. It's interesting. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, what about this humongous angel that I have that walks around with me? Why can't he take care of those coyotes for me? Why not? Hebrews 1.14 says they're given to us to do what we need them to do. They're there to serve us. You know, and all of a sudden, I just felt really, really secure and comfort. What, what was I doing? I was turning my eyes away from what I could do and what I and my own strength was capable of and recognizing that I have a really awesome God who loves, takes care of me, and basically could just keep those things away. But there are always what ifs. What if Goliath comes? And we have Goliaths in our life. You can think of a crisis even in this moment. Maybe it's a molehill. Maybe it's a, a mountain. Maybe it's a giant. Whatever it is you may be facing. And it seems like, how, what, how can I do something in this? What can I do to fix this? Wrong. David told the giant that he was going to feed him and his armies to the birds. And that's what happened slung his rocket, went into his forehead. And David must have been a strong young man because he took that big, huge sword, cut Goliath's head off. And I was thinking about how here he was, a young man. All these others had forgotten what God could do and what God had done for the nation of Israel. They'd long forgotten these things. And here David came 
and he came like a little child. Put that scripture up. I thought about this scripture when I was thinking about David and what Jesus did when he was walking along and after the people had come back from doing all their miracles and stuff. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and reveal them to babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. What are babes? They're children. He revealed it to childlike faith. What does childlike faith say? Childlike faith says, who is this Philistine that defies the armies of God? What is this thing in front of me that defies the armies of David, me, or you, or whoever it is? Who is it that defies my God, that takes his name in vain, that comes against me? And we know it's not people, but powers and principalities. What is this problem to God? God is always bigger than our problems, by far. And when I think about When I think about how David loved God, walked with God, knew God, knew what God was capable of, it was almost like this thing. And I wonder if he was even, I'm sure there was, there was this adrenaline and, 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 and kind of a fearful feeling as he went up, like, you know, I might get killed. But guess what? I'm going to rely on God. It doesn't matter. Now, there's a difference between being presumptuous and knowing, knowing the will of God in your life. And David knew that. David knew in that moment to go up. He didn't just presume, well, because you did it, then I can do it. And that's where we get into formulas and people hear about somebody doing this formula and it worked for them and so now I'm going to do that formula and it'll work for me. No. That's an incantation when it comes to that point. So I want you to stop for a minute. Maybe you're, you're facing something big in your life or you're not facing something big. You're facing something. And it's given you some stress. It's given you some anguish. It's, it's been somewhat an issue for you. And I want you just to close your eyes for a minute. If you, leaving your eyes open is easier, that's fine. And I want you to ask this question to God. God, are you really in control of your universe? Because if you are, I don't want to solve any more problems in my own strength. Second question. God, do you really love me? Third question, God, will you take care of me? So simply, if, if you feel good about those questions, that I want you just to take whatever this is before you. And I want you to place it in God's big hands. Cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. 
know how he loves us. And he is sovereign over the universe. So God, this Goliath, this mountain, whatever it is, I look to you. Do I need five smooth stones, sir? Do I let you just knock him out? Out of the way. I don't care, God, as long as it's you. And Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for trying to be in control. Forgive me for trying to figure it out and trying to do all these ideas that really didn't originate from you. And give me grace now to hear what you're saying. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, if you haven't celebrated communion with us, our bread is gluten-free, the red cup is wine, the green cup is juice. We ask that you come down the middle aisle and then exit out the sides. As I was listening to Pastor David preach, it really struck me that this communion table is an example of God's sovereignty it's his love and it's his care for us, that he is sovereign over everything, 